Hi everyone, this is Crime and Search. One night, a man returns home after a party at a friend's house. After he opened the door, he discovers something horrifying. His wife died on the living room floor. With extreme grief, he called 911, but as the police investigation progressed, all suspicions were found pointing to the man. Was he the murderer of his wife? What is the mystery behind the case? Let's dive deeper into the story. The incident took place in Missouri. The state is located in the Midwest of the U.S. and borders eight surrounding states. In eastern Missouri, there was a small city called Troy. It is part of Lincoln County, located three kilometers west of the Quiver River. About 10,000 people live here. The protagonist of the story is named Betsy. She was born in 1969, employed at an insurance company. At work, Betsy met a female colleague who was 11 years older than herself, Pam Hupp. Pam loves to chat with Betsy. Over time, Betsy and Pam become best friends who talk about everything. The two trust each other very much. Betsy also met a man named Russ. The two became lovers, and later they happily married. Betsy gave birth to two daughters. A family of four lives happily in Troy. In 2010, 41-year-old Betsy went to the hospital for examination due to physical discomfort. She found out she had breast cancer and it's in the late stage. In 2011, Betsy's condition worsens, and the cancer spread to the liver, but the illness did not break Betsy's will to live. She follows the doctor's advice and actively goes to the hospital for chemotherapy. Although there is little hope, Betsy is still happy to continue fighting. However, no one would have thought, soon after, Betsy would fall to another misfortune. Tuesday, December 27th, 2011, Betsy made an appointment with the hospital for chemotherapy on this day. Before going to the hospital, Betsy has an arrangement with her family. After her chemotherapy is over, the family went to Russ's parents' house for dinner. In the morning, Betsy headed to the hospital for chemotherapy. The husband went to the company to handle work affairs. As the day passes, at 5 p.m. in the hospital, Betsy got a call from her husband Russ saying he is going to a friend's house for a movie, so won't go back to Russ's mother's house for dinner. Betsy went to her mother-in-law's house for dinner after leaving the hospital. After dinner, her family was ready to send her home. Then shortly after, Betsy's friend Pam drove over and said she can take Betsy home. Since Betsy and Pam were best friends, her family let Betsy go with Pam. Then Pam drove Betsy to her house. At 9 o'clock in the evening, Betsy's husband Russ had been at a friend's house for three hours watching a movie. After the movie ended, Russ says goodbye to his friends and drove in the direction of home alone. At 9.40 p.m., Russ is back. He slowly opened the door. Immediately, he was stunned by the scene in front of him. His wife Betsy lying on her back on the floor full of wounds and blood all over the house. He was shocked. With trembling hands, he took out his phone and called 911. Lincoln County 911, what is the location of your emergency? <laughs> okay, ma'am. Hello? Hello? Yes, I need you to take a couple deep breaths so I can see what's going on. What is the address where you need this? I just got home from a friend's house and, and, and my wife, my wife killed herself. She's, she's, she's on the floor. Okay, Russell, I need you to calm down, honey, okay? I need you to calm down, take a couple deep breaths. We're going to get somebody on the way there, okay? <laughs> what What did she do? Do you know? She got a knife in her neck and she sliced her arms. <laughs> okay, okay, calm down, honey. <laughs> At 9.50 p.m., the medical staff rushed to the scene a few minutes after receiving the alarm. The police also arrived soon. Based on the coagulation degree of the blood at the scene, Betsy may have passed away an hour ago. The police cordoned off the scene and launched an investigation. Betsy had as many as 55 wounds on her body. Her wrist was cut. A serrated kitchen knife is still stuck in her neck. There is blood everywhere, on the floor, on the sofa, on the wall, on the ceiling. 
based on the shape of these blood stains and a part of the stains was painted on from a sock in the room, it can be inferred that the suspect may have done it on purpose to destroy the scene. On the light switch in the room, police found some blood stains. From it, the forensics extracted a man's DNA. After comparison, the DNA does not belong to the husband Russ. Another knife was found under a sofa pillow. The police also found a pair of bloodstained slippers in the closet. Based on that, the police think this is a planned murder. The police first interrogated the caller Russ, Betsy's husband. He said he got off work at 5 p.m. that day, made a phone call to his wife Betsy, and said that he would not go to his mother's house for dinner. Then at 5.22 p.m., he called his mother telling her he won't be coming home for dinner tonight. Then he drove to a friend's house to watch a movie. In addition, there were four other friends who watched together that night. After the movie, he left a friend's house at 9 p.m. He felt a little hungry on the way home, so he went to a gas station store to buy some food. He got home at 9.40, then he found my wife lying on the ground. Based on Russ's statement, police found four of his friends who were partying with him that night. They said that during the time period from 6 to 9 o'clock that night, they did watch a movie at one of their friends' house and Russ was also there the whole time. They can all testify. Then the police obtained gas station and store surveillance video. Sure enough, they found Russ in the footage. It is basically consistent with the time point described by him. The police then questioned all relatives who had seen Betsy that day. They said Betsy after dinner was picked up by a friend named Pam. The person was very enthusiastic about taking Betsy home. The police found Pam and she said Betsy and her are very good friends. She just happens to have something that she wanted to talk about with Betsy, so she picked her up and drove her home. Pam went on to say at about 7 o'clock in the evening, they arrived at Betsy's home. Afterward, the two chatted briefly. Then she drove back home and stayed at her home for the rest of the night. She has been watching TV at home with his husband and didn't go out again that night. The police then asked Pam for a polygraph test. Pam says she's had a head injury recently, therefore, the attending physician did not advise her to take a polygraph test. For this reason, the doctor also provided relevant evidence. Then Pam gave the police a key lead. She said Betsy told her that her husband Russ is very short-tempered, often drank too much, and threatened her. Betsy has been bothered by this lately. Betsy has considered filing for divorce. Then Pam suggested that the police could look up Betsy's computer. The police followed her advice and viewed Betsy's laptop. The technician discovered a Word document on Betsy's laptop. After opening, there is a text inside that seems like Betsy's diary. It involved Betsy fearing her husband is going to murder her. So far the police have taken the victim's husband Russ as the prime suspect. As the investigation progresses, the police also found something unusual. They were listening to the recording of the 911 call Russ made that night. When Russ described the state of his wife and the word used was suicide, the first paramedics to arrive at the scene believed that the victim had as many as 55 wounds on her body with a severed wrist and a knife on the neck. Ordinary people's first reaction after seeing it would never consider it suicide. Police found Russ had wild mood swings during questioning. More importantly, Russ accepted a polygraph request from the police and Russ failed the polygraph test. These suspicions made the police feel that Betsy's murderer was her husband Russ. Eight days after Betsy was killed, Russ was formally arrested by police. A charge of first-degree murder awaits him. Unable to pay $250,000 bail, Russ was being held at the Lincoln County Jail awaiting trial. November 18, 2013, two years later, the case officially opened for trial. A heated debate took place on whether Russ was the killer. The strongest evidence presented by the defense is his alibi. According to Betsy's friend Pam, it was around 7 o'clock in the evening on the day of the incident when she sends Betsy home and then left. Paramedics and police arrived at the scene at 9.50 a.m. Speculation on the time of Betsy's death was between 7 o'clock and 8.50 p.m. And this time, Russ is watching a movie with four other friends. Other than the four friends who can attest to Russ's presence, Russ also went into a store to buy food. The store surveillance camera's footage showed his presence and it was photographed clearly. This proves that Russ never had time to commit the crime. The prosecutors said the statement of watching a movie at a friend's house at 9 o'clock came from his four friends. No evidence or witness can support this statement. Suppose the friends are accomplices, then this alibi was invalid. 
As for the surveillance footage in the store, there are many shops along the way from Russ's friend's house to Russ's own house. It seems that Russ purposely chose to go there and took a long detour home that day to buy food in a store with surveillance cameras. The prosecutors had reason to suspect that Russ, after killing his wife Betsy, went to that store on purpose to create the illusion that he was on his way home. Aside from that, in the closet on the scene, there was a pair of slippers stained with blood. It is worth noting that there is only blood a size of a coin on the side of the slipper. The blood will definitely splatter all over the surface of the slippers rather than only the side. Judging from the surveillance video of the night, the clothes worn by Russ are the same as the clothes worn by the police when they arrived at the scene. The prosecution believed Russ was wearing the slippers that night and protective clothing similar to raincoats for murder. The purpose of this is to prevent blood from splashing on his body. However, since the raincoat is not fully covered, that caused blood accidentally splashes on the side of his slippers. Afterward, Russ was too nervous and did not see the blood. After committing the crime, Russ went shopping in a store with surveillance cameras to obtain an alibi. To this, Russ defense attorney Schwartz stated that the prosecution relied on a presumption of guilt. There's no direct evidence that defendant Russ is the murderer. Attorney Schwartz reminded the court five days before Betsy died, the sole beneficiary of her $150,000 life insurance policy changed from her husband Russ to her friend Pam. And Pam was probably the last person Betsy saw before she died. In contrast to Russ, Pam's alibi was not reliable. She had the time and motive as long as Pam is the direct beneficiary. Pam said it was Betsy's own wish to change the beneficiary. Betsy mentioned to herself many times during her lifetime that her husband Russ may have the intention of murdering her. Betsy has been feeling really scared lately. That's why she changed the beneficiary of the insurance to her friend Pam. Pam says she has a promise with Betsy that if an accident happens, the money will go towards child support for Betsy's two daughters and give the left of the money to the children when they grow up. So, Pam thought she would not benefit from Betsy's death. Pam also said she remembers driving Betsy home that day and saw Russ and another man sitting on a street outside a house. The prosecutor said in court that Russ is unaware of the modification of the beneficiary of the insurance. He may think that the beneficiary is still himself. So, Russ had a motive. With all the evidence, the computer files they presented in court, polygraph results, slippers with writing, Pam's testimony, and other evidence considered. After a period of deliberation, 12 juries came up with the result. The court verdict resulted in defendant Russ being convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. For the verdict, Russ pleaded not guilty. Later Russ filed an appeal but was rejected. It is worth noting that, a central premise of Russ' conviction, in this case, was based on the fact that four of his friends participated in the crime together or as false evidence. But prosecutors never filed any criminal charges against the four friends. At Russ' insistence on appeal, the case reopened after more than two years. The court session mainly revolved around the slipper with blood on it and the document inside the laptop. First of all, those slippers had no blood at all on the bottom. If they were worn during the crime, then he must have stepped on something. Therefore, defense attorneys believe that the blood stains on the slippers were there to frame Russ. For the document on the laptop computer, the expert says this document was written with Word software but there is no Word application installed on the computer. So, there is reason to speculate that the document was not created on Betsy's computer. In addition, aside from this document on her computer, no other similar document was found. This shows that Betsy did not have the habit of using a computer to write a diary. Therefore, the file in the computer and the blood stain on the slippers are likely there to deliberately frame Russ. Then the four friends of Russ testified again and they insisted that during the time period when Betsy was killed that night, Russ has no time to commit the murder at all. On November 7, 2015, after a long trial of the case, the jury came up with the court verdict, defendant yeah. Russ was not guilty of murder. At this moment, Russ, who spent nearly four years in prison, was finally released. He hugged his family tightly, they had waited too long for this moment. Russ finally cleared up his grievances. Since Russ wasn't the murderer of Betsy, so, who will the murderer be? The police then targeted the person who last saw Betsy, Pam. The reason Russ was convicted in the first trial was largely due to the jury believing Pam's testimony. If Russ wasn't the murderer, then Pam's suspicion is infinitely magnified. She is most likely the murderer of Betsy and framed Russ for the crime. However, the police found no substantive evidence. Then the case stalled. 
August 16, 2016. This is nine months after Russ was released. Missouri 911 emergency call center received a call. The operator heard a woman on the phone. She is preventing someone who's trying to get in the car and there was a man threatening the woman. The woman then called the police and kept calling the operator for help. After hearing this, the operator decisively notified the police to rush to the scene. When the police arrive, they saw a man lying in a pool of blood and a woman holding a revolver and hands standing aside blankly. The police then took the woman to the police station. The woman admitted that she was the one who called the police. This woman is no one other than Pam Hupp. Pam claimed she was in her car parked in her garage at the time. Then she saw a strange man approaching her car window wanting to talk to her. Then the man suddenly pulled out a knife and threatened her to drive to the bank and get Russ's money back. Then she took the opportunity to quickly slap the knife away from the man's hand and quickly run into the house. She took out one of her own revolvers for self-defense. That man was very strong and wanted to kill her like crazy. Pam had no choice but to shoot. She claimed she was in self-defense. The man was identified as 33 years old Louis Gampenberger. In 2006, he had a car accident and currently suffering from serious mental illness. Police recover a note from Gumpenberger who was shot dead. It says kidnap Pam and get the money from Pam's bank card for Russ. Take Pam back to the house and kill her. Make her look like when Betsy was killed. Get paid $10,000 when you're done. From various pieces of evidence, police suspect Russ hired someone to kill Pam. Russ might actually be responsible for the murder of Betsy by hiring a killer. That's why Russ had the alibi from four of his friends to absolve the crime. When Russ later found out the beneficiary of the wife's policy changed to Pam and Pam was a key witness for his years in prison, Russ was afraid of another mishap and decided to do the same as last time, hire another killer and kill Pam in the same way, then get back the claim money from Pam. This is all police speculation. Later the police changed their minds. After investigating the location records of Pam and Gumpenberger's mobile phones that day, investigators found that an hour before the incident, Pam's near were Gumpenberger's location. Obviously, the two of them knew each other which contradicts Pam's statement that she didn't know Gumpenberger. In addition, when police questioned residents living near Pam's home, a resident said a woman came to his house that day and this person claims to be a producer of a TV show. Then that person asked him to be part of a show. As long as he calls 911, he will get paid $1,000. This resident did not agree to participate. It is worth noting that there is a surveillance camera at the door of this resident's house and it showed that woman drove the same car as Pam. Even more surprising is that police found $9,100 bills on Gumpenberger. These bills have consecutive serial numbers with the four $100 dollar bills found on the dresser at Pam's house. According to the purchase record, the knife used by Gumpenberger was bought together with some items in Pam's house. Various pieces of evidence showed Pam pretending as a producer to trick the Gumpenberger into a paid play, creating a self-defense scene. The purpose is to frame all crimes to Russ. Seven days after the incident, the police, with sufficient evidence, formally arrested suspect Pam Hepp. After being arrested, Pam used the bathroom trip as an opportunity and attempted suicide in the toilet, but it was discovered and stopped by the police in time. In June 2019, more than two years after Pam's arrest, the case officially opened for trial. Defendant Pam was charged with first-degree murder. Pam's defense attorney offers Alford's plea. In federal courts, such a plea may be accepted as long as there is evidence that the defendant is actually guilty. The Alford guilty plea is a plea of guilty containing a protestation of innocence. The defendant pleads guilty, but does not have to specifically admit to the guilt itself. The defendants will receive relatively light sentences. The court then granted the defense's request for a plea agreement from Alford. Court verdict, defendant Pam Hepp was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Since it was Pam who initiated Alford's plea deal request, therefore she can avoid the death penalty. With his case closed, Lincoln County Attorney's Office announced that they will open a new investigation into the murder of Betsy that happened more than seven years ago. Pam Hepp will be charged with the murder of her friend. Betsy Faria